I think the key KPI should be satisfaction of your stakeholders. And you just measure it with an NPS. Let's say you're an analytics leader in a company, right? You need to first understand who are your stakeholders? Is it sales, marketing, security, compliance? Who is it? You need to understand that and then ask them, are you happy? Rate us between zero and 10. I believe that using such a simple measure and then pivoting to what your consumers want is probably a, the best measure of success because that will drive your prioritization. Instead of trying to build like a data warehouse, that should be the means to an end. Welcome to The Data Chief. The Data Chief is a podcast for data and analytics leaders to share their personal stories and insights on technology, culture, and leadership. You've likely seen the option to use Afterpay at one of your favorite retailers. Over the last two years, this Australian-based payment company has more than doubled its consumer base from 7 million to 19 million, and so successfully disrupted the payments market that it was acquired by Block, the parent company for such brands as Cash App, Square, and Tidal. Now, as part of the Block family, Afterpay Senior Director of Data Engineering and Governance, Natish Matthew, has made the move to Cash App, where his team's mission is to enable data and platforms for everyone in the company. Today, Natish joins the Data Chief to offer insights on how he measures success, both in terms of his own team and analytics programs in general. He also covers why stakeholder satisfaction is the ultimate KPI, the importance of taking risks, and how to balance governance with user freedom. All of this and more with Natish Matthew. Everything discussed in this interview are Natisha's personal thoughts and opinions and do not reflect those of Afterpay or Block. The Data Chief is presented by our friends at ThoughtSpot, the modern analytics cloud company. ThoughtSpot makes it easy for anyone to analyze your company's data with search and AI. Business people from companies like Walmart, Hulu, Schneider Electric, Cloud Academy, and Workato use ThoughtSpot to quickly uncover new insights and turn them into action. You can learn more at ThoughtSpot.com. Nitish, welcome to the Data Chief. Thank you, Cindy. And where are you joining us from today? I'm uh, joining you from Melbourne, Australia. Wow. So Melbourne, I am pic picturing a jog along the river with the Melbourne cricket grounds in across the river. How far are you a cricket fan now or? Uh, Look, I'm from India. Um, we Indians have uh, cricket in our blood. So, okay. and yes, and, I, and I'm actually like uh, probably about uh, four miles from the MCG. Oh, Not very far. nice. Yeah, beautiful place. So, Natish, as a data and analytics leader at Af Afterpay, recently merged with Block, part of Square and Cash App. Cash App. Tell us what changes you're most excited about as you join the Block family. Uh, Cindy, I think probably the most important thing is, uh, is the purpose. Uh, we are all very excited by Block's vision of economic and empowerment for all. I think that's a fantastic uh, mission to get excited about. Ultimately, I believe that people and teams work really well when they are motivated by purpose. Secondly, for a technologist like me, scale is a challenge. And uh, to put some context to it, uh, after pay, we were producing data uh, by servicing 16 million consumers, Block has got 70 million. So we expect data volumes to go 5x. That brings up its own host of challenges. And that is very exciting for, uh, for somebody like me in the data tech space. Okay, so, and I have to parse this a little bit. Um, first off, for some people who do not know Afterpay, yep. I, I think let, let's describe what Afterpay is. And I had to chuckle because I'm not a very good shopper myself, but last night as I was shopping at the one retailer that I really like, it kept coming up, Afterpay, Afterpay. <laughs> and I thought, wow, uh, this is kind of serendipitous. But tell us a little bit about Afterpay. So look, Afterpay was uh, a company that was founded about six years ago um, after the global financial crisis. I think the 
um, the millennial population in Australia and many parts of the world were looking for a more responsible way to pay. And then our founders, Nick Molar and Ann Tyson, uh, listen to those customers and, and they realize that people want uh, better control over their finances. So uh, the, the product is very simple. The product is if you want to buy something for $100 today, um, if we approve you, you need to pay only $25 as the first installment and then pay $25 across three other installments across uh, six weeks. We provide value to merchants in opening up a new customer base and so our relationship is directly with the merchant. So it is a simple model, and then we've kept the product extremely simple. And that appealed to consumers in Australia, in the UK, in the US, and it has started a whole global trend and a new industry. So we are particularly proud of, of that. Now, it's, yeah. I think it's almost a verb here. It, it's a verb there. Well, you know you've arrived when you're a verb. So so really, that really nice suit, it it's telling me buy it now and pay as I go. Now you did mention something about the millions of subscribers. And I was looking at some of your 2020 data when it was only seven, well only, when it was seven million subscribers. Did I just hear you say it's, what is the number now? I think it's uh, um, our total consumer base is around 16 million. Uh, it keeps on increasing on a daily basis. Of course, but talk about high growth. So it's it's not just a purpose-driven organization. It's also high growth in a digital space. That's right. I think we've, uh, we've been a really good product company in the sense that we listened to the consumers, kept the product simple, and then uh, met a need that was always there and was consistent uh, with how we executed. Yeah, and so part of that ability to execute is running in the cloud. Tell us a little bit about the journey to cloud, particularly in the data and analytics tier, and what might have surprised you? Uh, in the data world, cloud has been such an enabler. Um, so look, I. I've just completed 20 years of uh, my career in data, and I still remember the time when if you needed a data warehouse, you had to actually wait like six months because we needed to have data center space, we need to have trucks rolling its servers, we need to get disk, we need to get networking done, we need to actually have power. It, it was a huge project. And then we had appliances come in, then now in the cloud, all you need is a credit card. And yeah your creativity and then the the time to solving data problems is now in days if you are really motivated so that has been a massive enabler and and also um as you get more sophisticated in data right uh, let's say you have a specific problem that uh, you need to understand relationships between customers and uh, and and suddenly it's a graph network problem Cloud providers have many, or most of them have, have out of the box cloud databases. It's just switching on a cloud database to solve a, a network analysis problem in seconds and shutting it down when you are done with it is, is nothing sort of magical. It's unthinkable 15 years ago. So what the cloud has done is it, it's like Lego blocks for kids. What you make with it is up to your imagination. Yeah, I like that analogy of Lego blocks for kids. But for some reason, some people are still anxious about it. And you referred to your more than 20 year span in this space. And I want to actually call out that your team was awarded, um, your team received a, an award related to your use of Netiza which yeah. was considered pioneering in the day, but like 10 years ago. So if you think about this change in technology and mindset, what's harder, the technology or the mindset? The technology is easy. The, the mindset uh, is harder. Um, the, uh, I think you use the word anxiety, right? I think anxiety may come from risks. Is, is there any, any security risk, privacy risk, um, cost risk? So there are multiple risks. I, I think we just need to um, understand what are the risks that somebody may have and then figure out uh, using data, can we actually remediate those risks? 
if you take security risk, right? Usually all these cloud providers um, have got a really, really solid information on all sorts of compliance that they would have done. And um, uh, they usually have a, a partnership model where security is, is um, a job for both parties, both the vendor and uh, you. So you also have tremendous control over security. If you take uh, compliance risks and um, operational risk, cost risks, et cetera, I think cloud has come a long way where you as a consumer have got tremendous control. You need to invest a little bit of time and effort in understanding how cost dynamics works across cloud. If you take most cloud providers, they usually have cost reservations. If you know your, uh, your uh, intended load, they've got things like spot instances where you can actually get unused capacity at the cloud at a very low discount. Uh, and the way you craft solutions, right? I think the one thing that usually people get wrong is they take a data center mentality to the cloud and they, when they do lift and shift, they think like a data center and then let me buy enough server for my maximum compute load for the beginning of the month query run, right? You should not do that. In your in the cloud, you get, you, it gets you the opportunity to, to under spec your hardware and reduce costs. And then you spec up and down and use elasticity effectively. So I would say that anxiety can be dealt with by understanding the reasons, understanding what the cloud providers actually provide, and then um, really having a solid team who knows how to make use of the cloud effectively. You cannot take a data center mentality and transform it to the cloud. It doesn't work well. Yeah, so some of that is about reskilling and learning how yeah. you operate in a new world. Correct. It's funny you mentioned Nitiza and, and uh, about Nitiza, how they were pioneers 10 years ago. The business problem that Nitiza addressed remains exactly the same. What did Nitiza address? Nitiza performance. addressed performance. Yes, performance. Uh, hey, I want a query to come back in, in 10 minutes instead of six hours. So the second uh, thing that Nitiza addressed was getting a system up and running took months. They said, hey, you become a customer, we roll up a, a, a twin fin 12 box and you're off and running to the races because everything is built in. And then you don't need to actually have like multiple DBAs and different teams to manage it because it's a, it's a fully managed uh, system. Uh, cloud took it to the next level where you don't even need to actually uh, think about how much of, how big a Nitiza box you want. Uh, and again, it's a time to market. So you don't even need to have the box running in your data centers. You just connect and go. Yeah, connect and go. And I think the expectations have changed. A 10 minute answer back seems slow to me now. Exactly. I, I think, uh, I think um, look, we've all been, um, uh, I, I call this the, uh, the Facebook problem, right? People have gotten used to a Facebook page loading in like 500 milliseconds. They expect uh, complex analytical queries to come back in milliseconds. It pushes us to get creative. It's possible in many, many cases with some of the technology we have right now, but, but absolutely. Yeah, so technology is the enabler, Natish, but you recently wrote an article on how to measure success of analytics efforts. And it was so good that we actually published it as a primary article on the Data Chief Hub this week. But let's dive a little bit into that. What do you think are the key ways of measuring the impact and success of the work you do? First of all, thank you very much for promoting the article. Uh, I'll give you a little bit of background. Uh, it, it was again, my 20 years of working in data and, uh, uh, and I was reflecting on my work and, and I was thinking about many articles that came recently, including uh, from Randy Bean's uh, articles on a lot of projects fail, like right? only like 15% uh, of projects succeed. So I was thinking, why is that? And as an industry, a 15% success rate is not great. So maybe we, Mia, are we actually aiming for the wrong success measures? Then I was reflecting on what could be a good success measure. And then usually a good success measure may actually change your behavior and what you optimize for. And then based on my experience of success and failures, what I felt is um, this actually goes back to a statement uh, um, from uh, this gentleman, um, Satya Kotu, uh, one of the speakers in your uh, podcast a couple of episodes ago, he mentioned about 
uh, their team at ServiceNow being an enabler. And the sales uh, head saying that Satya is the sales MVP because he has made data usable. I think the key KPI should be satisfaction of your stakeholders. And you just measure it with an NPS. You ask your stake, let's say you are an analytics leader in a company, right? You need to first understand who are your stakeholders? Is it sales, marketing, security, compliance? Who is it? You need to understand that and then ask them, are you happy? Rate us uh, between zero and 10. If you take the NPS methodology, the nine or 10 means you're a promoter um, and uh, zero to six is a laggard. And I think so, and the in between scores are like passives. If you get tens from all, you know you're doing a good job that will force you to listen to them and think about what do they really want? I believe that using such a simple measure and then pivoting to uh, what your consumers want is probably a, the best measure of success because that will drive your prioritization. Instead of trying to build like a two petabyte data, uh, data warehouse, that, that, is, that should be the means to an end. If the two petabyte uh, data warehouse you built in six, in 12 months, doesn't push your NPS score to nine or 10, you have failed. You would rather build like a hundred GB database and then actually get people what they want than the other one. So, uh, and it also comes from uh, the technology background that many of us have, right? We are too enamored by the tools and the shiny objects that we lose sight of what is it all about? Yeah, so, so well said. And actually the data in that database has not delivered any value until it's accessible for analytics and insight. Correct. Now, so working for a tech company, we have the luxury that we actually, within our product, ask customers to give NPS scores back. If you are an analytics leader in a company, how do you actually capture that NPS? And how often do you do it? It can be as simple as a quarterly survey. Quarterly survey. Okay. That's it. You 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 go to Survey Monkey free account. You send a survey to fifty people, and that's really all you need. And then the second thing is you can ask people for verbatim feedback as to what are the things that you can improve, what are the things you should start doing, stop doing, continue doing, and uh, and the next phase is for the people. Uh, you should probably meet with two sets of people, right? The people who give you really high marks and the people who give you really low marks. You would want to have one-on-one -on -one conversations with, with people, build relationships with them and, and truly understand what their pain points are. I would probably just segue that to uh, the uh, principles of product management. That's something that uh, I found extremely valuable in, in my work in the last three years. Uh, product thinking is all about putting the customer in front asking them what is it they want, and then having customer needs drive your work. So, um, so yeah, I think once a quarter, and the key thing is to keep asking the same questions again and again, so that you have a benchmark and you can see how things are going. Hopefully yeah. after some time, you can probably stop the survey if you're doing really good. I, I often recommend that before anyone embarks on a new effort, whether it's a new data set, a new analytics platform, cloud migration, whatever, that they take a baseline, where are they yeah. today, and then measure the progress. So I like your point of making sure you ask the same questions to get that longitudinal analysis. Um, do you, How do you feel about actually doing a return on investment calculation? Return on investments are extremely tenuous. Uh, and trying to relate, uh, let's say, uh, let's say increase in clicks directly to an analytics initiative uh, is, is probably it's probably not worth the effort. Uh, there's another angle, Cindy, right? I think uh, um, um, if you think about data, I think uh, the same data point. This is something that I've always talked about. Is the same data can be used for different things. Let's say you have an order table, right? The order table can uh, can be used for for marketing, can be used for sales, can be used for finance. So it's it's like a gift that keeps on giving. So how do you measure ROI of an order table that you spent a month of an engineer's time to build? It's super hard, and um, 
uh, I've not found any really solid way to do that. And, and something that I've realized, again, I think as I get older is uh, life is too short to actually focus on things that may not add much value. Uh, so I decided that Let it's it probably not a way. <laughs> Let it go. <laughs> and, then, uh, uh, and then don't worry about it. Yeah, yeah. Or or I think sometimes for funding pe- purposes, people will do yeah. this, organizations have to do it. So then it's the first project in, and then the yeah. rest just get the economies of scale. Do you think about this differently if it's a machine learning algorithm versus general analytics? Look, my, my general um, uh, thesis is that machine learning is just another uh, tool set. In the, in the armory of an analyst. Now, uh, in certain companies, machine learning teams are considered separate and their focus is on, on productionizing work of analysts and data scientists. Probably in those cases, they may have a more um, direct impact in let's say customer conversion, right? And then you may be able to have metrics like gain. Is your machine learning model keeping up with incoming data? How resilient is it to actually changing conditions? Uh, Probably at that point in machine learning terms, uh, teams are more like software engineering teams than analytical teams. But largely, I believe it's ML is more of a tool in in, uh, the toolkit than a separate thing. So you have a lot of tools in the toolkit and we are both aligned in trying to meet the needs of the business for business performance. But there's often a disconnect or conflict between the data team or IT. How can IT be more supportive of the business? I think uh, there are multiple aspects to this, right? One, I think IT teams also need to understand that they are business, but their role is a supporting role. So, Uh, If you think about business being the customer facing teams of a company and you just happen to be supporting them and that is okay. I think uh, people um, need to understand what their purpose in an organization is. Uh, In many cases, what I've found is this is this type of conflict comes from organizational dysfunction than than anything. If you take again, uh, going back to Satya, right, Uh, his uh, his approach to this is, look, we are an enabler. Our success is the success of our teammates. Uh, And uh, one book that uh, a a coach recommended to me, uh, a mentor recommended to me many years ago, is this book called uh, Five Dysfunctions of the Team. Uh, And uh, it's a beautiful book. I would strongly recommend uh, any any leader to read it. Ultimately, you have a really strong company when independent teams support each other. So if you, if you decide that your purpose and your success is, is you seeing your, let's say your sales teams or your or finance teams being successful, you will have less conflict because you're focused on, on their success. So ultimately, I think it all comes back from trust, good communication, and then understanding that all of us need to actually play a role in this, this orchestra, if you will, right? and uh, where everybody, every instrument has a piece, only then if they work harmoniously, you produce a beautiful note. Oh, so I I like the harmony um, analogy. And trust for sure is important, but I'm gonna push back here because there are so many conflicts and the business will say, I'm fed up with IT, they move too slowly. I'm just going to do my own thing and hire my own consultants. Yeah. I think what we need to understand at that point in time is uh, how can we enable them to hire consultants? I think, uh, I, uh, again, what I have done in some of my teams is what we've realized is uh, in many problems, a decentralized model is actually better. IT doesn't need to do everything. And uh, in, in some of the conversations that I've had, as organizations grow also, right, probably uh, we need to reinvent what we do. To some extent, I think if trying to keep on doing what you have always been doing, let's take the case of a centralized data platform, for example, right? It works up till a certain scale. After that, it simply doesn't work well because it's it's a completely different 
um, set of problems, communication becomes extremely hard. At that point in time, IT should reinvent themselves to be more enablers and then enable actually teams to have their own uh, team members. For example, the concept of an analytical engineer is a good case in point. Um, so I think, um, I think, yeah, so I think these are these are deep questions. I think some of them are, uh, are uh, related to organizational dynamics, but ultimately I think if both the teams understand the outcome that we are trying to facilitate, then yeah, uh, to answer your question, if somebody wants to actually have uh, independent, let's say analysts or engineers in their teams, IT should support them and not yes. push back. Well, okay, so now I have to wear the hat of the IT person or the sure. centralized data team. Yeah. And I'm gonna say, what? You wanna have se true self-service analytics. You're gonna have yeah. these novices interpreting data, creating their own queries. It will be the wild west, it will be anarchy. And you even use the word, the analytics engineer, which yeah. I think is actually the new sexiest job for the decade. Uh -huh for the world, but the analytics engineer is even worse because they're creating their own pipelines. So th this just sounds like chaos. And we're gonna have a breach. Maybe have I laid out all the fears of IT? <laughs> uh, that's definitely, um, uh, your, your fears are warranted, but this is where IT needs to think like, what would Steve Jobs do? If you think about somebody like Steve Jobs, right? Steve Jobs would say, all right, the need of the team is to have an analytics engineer who is empowered to actually build their own pipelines. How would I create a very easy to use data quality framework, which is so effortless that he or she finds it very easy to use it so that you are assured of good quality checks. How would I create a secure ecosystem in which they are put in a wall garden of if you take an iPhone, right? You can't just do anything on the iPhone, but still you are not obstructed from doing anything that you want within limits. So IT should be building an iPhone ecosystem where different, um, different departments can put in their own apps safely and get to do what they want. That requires tremendous creativity, that requires amazing engineering and requires user focus, right? If you take security, security is a, in every company, I strongly believe security is a collective responsibility and you get really good outcomes by providing tools, frameworks, providing guardrails, monitoring, and also culture. You'll probably get more secure data by promoting a really good security and privacy focused culture in addition to technology and not just uh, you need my approval to do stuff. That, that never scales well. So, yeah. so yes, I, yeah. So my, my solution to that is you, you really need to think about what's the outcome again and think about how can we facilitate that, but in a way that works for both the company, IT and uh, the business department. Yeah, the walled garden is actually a great analogy and even that you take the iPhone because I was gonna push back and say, well, it's easy for you, you're in finance, what about healthcare? Um, yeah. we, ca we can't have, um, you know, th then it becomes a life or death situation for some, but your analogy of the walled garden with the iPhone where there really is tight governance, but then a lot yes. of freedom. That's correct, right? And, and also it's a question of uh, clear accountability, right? Who is responsible for this? And, uh, and uh, it's a, if IT defines their success as, if I'm able to enable analytics engineers in 20 of my departments and still be secure, my productivity has become 24. Now I am probably the most successful IT team in the world. Yeah, and I think you've also written about that or spoken about yeah. how if you are really successful, yeah. you're, you're actually, um, your job in a way is becoming smaller. I think it depends on how you define success, right? If you define success as what is the size of my team, then it's a different, I think that's a traditional way some people measure their success. If you define your success as impact, then you would probably say, and it's it's less headache to manage a team if you actually are able to <laughs> empower like 
I, I mean, the, the example that I tell uh, uh, some team members is, if, I believe um, uh, WhatsApp or Instagram, when they were acquired by Facebook, like billions of dollars, like 20 people, there is a lot that of an empowered, focused, purpose-driven set of 10 people can do. You probably get more work done with lesser number of people and lesser teams if you architect it well. So a smaller team, but with a supersized yes. impact, more reach. Correct. And then they, ha they have to be purpose-led, right? They, they understand what their, what their mission is, um, what is success for them, right? And, and again, uh, this reminds me of um, another podcast episode uh, from the, uh, the, I think the CDO from GM. I forget his name. What he, he mentioned. Yeah, uh, yes. And I, I loved what he mentioned about teams. What he mentioned is people need to um, have, uh, I think, I believe what he said is uh, his purpose. They need to be able to grow and they need to feel safe and happy. Right? There, are, there are three dynamics. If you have a team with people who's got purpose, who, who feels like they are contributing to the company and they are learning, and then it's a, it's a fun place to be and they, um, they are happy, uh, you don't need a lot of people. You can, you can get huge amount of work done. Yeah, that's great. Well, Natish, thank you for like studiously listening to all these great podcast guests as people will be doing with your episode. But you you mentioned purpose a few times and you mentioned the purpose of um, the, the company overall. Do you actually have a mission statement for your team? For, uh, yes, yes. For, for, again, for the team, uh, for, for my org, our mission is to actually enable data and platforms for everybody in the company. It's very simple. In addition to a mission, you need to have a vision. The vision is, okay, this is, this is, this is our purpose, right? Why do we exist? Our vision is, where do you want to go? And the mission for some teams that I've seen is, enable everybody uh, in the company to access data and every query comes back in like 10 seconds and uh, make sure that all the data sources people care about are provided. It is a very hard to achieve end state, but it's as aspirational. So you need to have a vision, which is where you want to go. And then you need to have a strategy. The strategy is, oh, how are you going to get there? You need to have all of these things. You need to have a mission, the why, the, uh, a vision, where are we going? and the strategy, how are we going to get there? So I think we need all of these things and it's the job of the leader to actually set those and inspire people. Yeah, that's great. It's I like how you've summed that up. Um, if you think about across your decades of experience in this space, can you share a particular use case when data and insight had a significant impact? Look, uh, there are so many to mention, um, but I would say one of the most exciting things that uh, that I've had a chance to be part of um, was this work uh, on improving search engine results for the Afterpay shop directory. Actually, you can go to Google and search for Afterpay tech blog, and one of the articles over there is about how data was used to improve uh, the consumer experience in uh, in the afterpay shop directly. The problem was very simple. When you when you search for say a shoes um, or something or a brand, it came back with you using only keyword search uh, matching. But then uh, our our ML teams, our data scientists uh, and data engineers work together to actually figure out how do you actually use um, uh, consumer feedback and use ML models to actually provide more relevant. Uh, search results. And the way they did it is, is in a true, um, uh, very collaborative, iterative fashion. They did not try to actually build something that took six months. It, it, they, they put everything out there every three weeks. It also speaks to what the culture of our company. So it's, it's a, I think it's a very good example of everything coming together. We had analysts, we had data scientists, we had ML engineers, we had data engineers, we had a product team who were very focused on the problem they wanted to solve and then did it in an iterative fashion and then measured their success well and then got to a great outcome. So 
Yeah, check out Afterpay Tech blog, and then I think it should be one of the articles there. So Okay, great. We'll also share that on the show notes page. So if I think about this, though, I'm hearing you talk about agile, iteration, fast. And so part of that culture also comes from working at a startup, which you didn't always do. You, you've also worked for a cable company, insurance, consulting. Yes. So how much of this is the culture of innovation and risk taking? I think culture of innovation and risk taking uh, fundamentally is not, need, need not be restricted to startup companies. I think if you have, uh, let's take Google. I think Google did a study of uh, uh, what makes some teams successful a couple of years ago. And, they, and the number one thing that came over psychological safety. Is your team empowered to uh, make mistakes? If you take Randy Bean's latest book, uh, Fail Fast, Learn Faster. I, I think if you have the right support um, my, if I have to recall my boss at, at Cablevision, which is a $7 million um, company in the New York metro area. Uh, she, it was a traditional company by any sense, but, uh, but she was extremely supportive. Uh, she gave us good guidance on how to approach problems. She gave us context and, and we made mistakes, but, and, and she was fine with that. I think even in a traditional company, there was, if you have the right culture and a supportive leader and good guidance in place, I think any company can, can take risks. I mean, if you, if you take some, somebody like, uh, let's take, let's take the, let's take the whole, um, the coronavirus situation, right? I'm sure data was an integral part of the work that went into getting the vaccine out. And imagine the collaboration and the analysis that they had to do in a very fast-paced way to solve humanity's biggest problem <laughs> in in uh, in near history. So, uh, and I'm sure they would have taken some risks and balanced it with the benefit. Yeah, it was a forcing function that I still. There's parts of it that we could have done better, but yes. there's parts of it that I think we did well. So if you think about this culture of taking risks and celebrating failures, yeah. can you share an example of a failure or yeah. a lesson learned? And what was that? And how did you celebrate it? Look, there are, uh, there are so many failures to, to list out. So. Um, so probably, um, I would say um, many years ago, um, I, I worked for um, uh, a small startup, uh, uh, which actually failed twice. And I think that was, uh, that was um, uh, it was in the reinsurance brokerage firm. So the problem at that point in time that I think there were a couple of problems. One, we were sort of far ahead at the times. So the market was not ready for the product probably. So there was, we had not, ad I, I believe we had not addressed the viability risk uh, and, the, and the acceptance risk of a product, right? And the viability problem was we were trying to use data uh, and use massive parallel processing and trying to literally invent Hadoop. We, and if we had actually kicked off that uh, project, let's say five years down the line, we had Hadoop, we had massively parallel processing. A lot of the problems we struggled with, um, and, which is the viability risk would have been avoided. So again, this uh, this is not some, this is something I realized after I started reading um, uh, in the books by Marty Kagan on, on product management. Uh, and uh, uh, as a, uh, we had a, an amazing teacher, his name is uh, Christian Idioti. I, I'll suggest the viewers to look him up on, on YouTube. Um, where they talk about product management and talk about the different risks of product management. What are the risks you're trying to solve for? So, um, so look, I think understanding risks properly uh, is now something I've gotten better at. I've learned it the hard way. And now there's a structure to it, uh, which interestingly enables you to take more risks because you have a good understanding. And, and again, um, and I'm also a big fan of General Stan McChrystal, uh, the U.S. General, and he's released a book uh, recently called Risk, about risk. I think I'm, I'm, I'm still had to read it, but I think uh, having a really good understanding of risk is imperative for leaders in this extremely volatile and changing world. 
Yeah, so Natish, you've already mentioned four great books. <laughs> I often ask, okay, we come to that as a lightning round at the end. We've sprinkled this one throughout, but you mentioned Stan McChrystal in terms of you admire his leadership style. Can you elaborate? What is it about his leadership style that's so important to you? Yeah, the, in some in some of his books, uh, he he tells about the story of how the U.S. forces had the tremendous challenge of dealing with a completely seemingly disorganized enemy in Iraq and Afghanistan, and then how the old command and control structures of the army didn't really work. So, if there was a, a problem on the ground, the U.S. the, the troops were were we're waiting for orders from higher above on what to do. They realized that that doesn't really work. So what he realized is we need to have team of teams. Essentially, you need to have completely empowered teams which have full context of the mission and, com and extensive communication, I think, which was a very big diversion from the, uh, from the traditional military command and control structure. I think that was a huge, huge takeaway for me. Uh, as I scaled my teams, I realized that the first thing I need to do is give up control. Many leaders realize uh, they're important. They feel like their importance comes from A, making decisions and B, having control. Both these things are anti-patterns. If you are a good leader, my general rule of thumb is, if you are in the same meeting with your uh, the people reporting to you all the time, you have failed as a leader, which means you haven't empowered them. Your job and what I learned from General McChrystal is you need to have teams of teams where teams have the context, they have the decision-making power, they have clear guardrails for success. And you enable them to actually uh, react and respond to issues, whether it's in the battlefield or whether it's a changing business requirement, whatever it is, they should be able to make those decisions. So I think uh, uh, I think that is is... It's probably a really good management knock structure model for uh, the current and future uh, world. What I find so interesting about this is when I look at characteristics of really impactful data chiefs, whatever your title may be, it yeah. is this leadership style. We had Scott Peck on from PwC on season one of the data chief, and he recommended a book, uh, Turn the Ship Around which is a submarine uh, story. And it really mm -hmm. is about having that ability to make everyone a leader and yes. empowering them. So I think, I think I'm seeing a pattern here, a theme here. <laughs> um, if you think about so much, our, our industry moves at such a fast pace and there's always lots of learning that needs to happen. What do you think is the main challenge facing our profession today? And especially maybe those younger professionals entering the data space. I think um, probably uh, for people, let's take young profession who may join as a data analyst or a data scientist or a data engineer or whatever, or a business intelligence analyst. If I'm joining the profession right now in any of those roles, what I would focus on is, is understanding context of business, understanding developing really good depth in, in some areas, and then breadth. I think focus is important. Uh, if you take something like Matt Turk's uh, data tools landscape, there are thousands of tools and there are thousands of things. I think the the area is so confusing and vast that you may get uh, um, defocused on 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 uh, trying to do everything. So, probably one thing that I would advise people to do is just just learn in depth about a certain area, understand, explore a couple of things. If you start off as a data analyst and then you feel like programming is more interesting, automation is more interesting, you should check out data engineering. And then let's say, and you and don't get, uh, don't chase shiny objects all the time. You suddenly hear about ML engineering and think that's the coolest thing. Don't chase that. Uh, you, you need really good fundamentals uh, before you can actually build on top of that. If you need to have a really good understanding of SQL, it's not going, it's not gone in 40 years. It's not going anywhere. 
you need to have a really good understanding of how computers work. I, I find that many people don't really have a good understanding of actually processing, data processing, basic stuff. And um, you need to act, what I would also suggest to uh, young people joining this, you need to have a really good understanding of, uh, of business and, and how teams work. Because uh, one of the best managers I had in my life, what he told me is, there are only very few projects um, that uh, impactful projects that you can do without multiple teams collaborating together. Understanding how to well work well with teams across the organization is one very important um, uh, quality that I think uh, the uh, that managers need to speak more about. I think it's it's, it's huge. So so I would say uh, learn the fundamentals well explore different areas, but focus on something, understand how to work well in massive organizations and teams. I think those are things that I would suggest to any aspiring data professional or any IT professional. Yeah, I think those are such solid recommendations, but I think you also articulated why this profession can be so hard because yeah. look at everything you need to know, the technology and data, the business yeah. domain, and then the people organizational dynamics. It's yeah. a lot. It's a lot, and you can get overwhelmed. And uh, and you know, if you're lucky, you know, I've been very lucky in my in my career to get uh, uh, amazing managers who coached me a lot. Probably being completely open to uh, coaching is is very useful. Yes, constructive feedback, constructive criticism. If you think about some of those coaches you've had, is there one of those leaders you would recommend for the Data Chief Podcast? Oh. Uh, 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 probably not the, the my managers themselves. Uh, I, I was I was um, I'm fascinated by uh, how uh, the U.S. military uh, manages information, and I would have loved to have the data chief of General Stan McChrystal uh, ah. to be in this podcast <laughs> because if you think about risks in the military, you've got a lot of sensitive information, and he talks about how he changed work by communicating information broadly to thousands of people every day in their conference call. Th that is completely different to what you would hear about uh, with military and, and, and secret missions, right? So what they realized is I think the risk of not sharing the information, collating data from different places, bringing it together. If you think about, if you think about any military operation, it's a massive business intelligence problem. Yes. You need to get you need to get human intelligence. You need to get satellite remote sensing data. You need to get you need to understand um, uh, let's say even financial um, growth, economic development in a region to understand the risk of uh, attacks. You need to bring all of these things together and then take your scarce resource and then put them uh, to play in in different problems. It, yeah. I, I'll be fascinated to understand how, um, let's say, the Marine Corps actually manages information, their BI team. OK, let's see if we can make that happen. Natish, you've shared so many great insights and so many excellent books. It's clear you're very well read. You're always investing in your own learning. I always like to end with a question, though. If you think back um, in the last couple of years, it's been a crazy few years, challenging for many, but what are you most grateful for, maybe beyond the obvious of health and family? Australia. I've lived in Australia for the last 10 years. My first 20 years was in India, the next 10 years was I was in the US, but I'm really thankful now, I'm, I'm an Australian citizen right now, especially with the with the pandemic and all those things that happened. I'm extremely grateful for uh, uh, being sitting where I am five miles away from ever from the MCG. And it's a beautiful country. It's a beautiful people. So I'm very grateful for uh, uh, where I am right now. I, I, I was reflecting on, on you know, gratitude and I was thinking I, I've taken this for granted. Okay, well, so let's not take it for granted. And let's, um, I'm hoping in 2022, I can get back to Australia. And maybe we can have a fabulous coffee, a really strong coffee sitting by that river. Certainly. 
Nitish, thank you so much for being on the Data Chief. My pleasure. Thank you very much, Cindy. Uh, the first time I actually met you was in a classroom in the TDWA conference in Orlando. It, it's it's such a privilege to be uh, sitting and talking to you right now here. Wow, you have such a good memory. So now I'm going to have to send you a BI scorecard black bear that I used to give out there. Or maybe you have one. I don't know. <laughs> well, I would love to get one. Thank you. Okay, we'll figure that out. Have a great day. Thank you.